Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. A very warm welcome to you all to the 35th Asian Impact Webinar and the first one in collaboration with the World Health Organization. My name is Matthias Helble and I'm a scientist in the Research for Health Department of WHO and currently on leave from ADB. My colleague, Dr. Dangyan Park, Principal Economist in the Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department of ADB, will kick off this webinar with a short presentation on the new book. Dong Yang is also the person who has led this innovative research project over the last one and a half years. Dong Yang, over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dong Yang Park of the research department at the Asian Development Bank. And I would like to welcome everybody who is here today to attend the launch of the ADB book, Wellness for a Healthy Asia. You can access the book for free at the link shown on the screen. The book is a collective volume which brings together the research papers that were prepared as background material for the special theme chapter of Asian Development Outlook 2020. The special theme chapter was Wellness in Worrying Times. The Asian Development Outlook, or ADO, is ADB's annual flagship report, which is published twice a year. You can access the special theme chapter Wellness in Worrying Times in ADO Update 2020 in the link shown on the screen. The book's editors are Filipinas Quising, Gerard Bodeker, Matthias Helble, Irfan Qureshi, Shutian, and myself, Tongyan Park. I would like to give a special thanks to Pilipinas, who was my partner in crime throughout the book's production process, and also to Gerard Bodeker for his invaluable strategic intellectual guidance. Thanks also to Matthias, Irfan, and Shu for their many substantive contributions to the book. Finally, I would like to give special thanks to Ophelia Young and to Catherine Johnston of the Global Wellness Institute for their enormous intellectual contributions to this book. Without their contributions, this book would simply not have been possible. The title of our book is Wellness for a Healthy Asia. But what is wellness exactly? Wellness is closely related to well being and health, but it is conceptually different. More precisely, wellness refers to the active pursuit of activities, choices, and lifestyles that lead to a state of holistic health. In other words, Wellness is the activities that we do and the lifestyle choices that we make in order to achieve well being and good health. As such, it is a dynamic concept. Wellness is a multi dimensional concept which encompasses physical, mental, spiritual, emotional, social, and environmental dimensions. Let me now briefly discuss the structure of the book. The first part of the book explains why wellness has become a central issue during the COVID-19 pandemic. In this connection, the first chapter, why does wellness matter so much in the age of COVID-19? a selective literature review by Park and Quising 
looks at the looks at the large and growing number of studies which examine the uh, importance of wellness in COVID-19. The second chapter, the global wellness industry and its implications for Asia's development is by Young and Johnston of the Global Wellness Institute. The chapter defines the concept of wellness and provides an overview of the global wellness industry, including its size. The chapter then proceeds to discuss the implications of wellness and wellness industry for developing Asia's development. The second part of the book explores the current landscape of wellness and wellness industry in developing Asia. The third chapter by Fateh Ahmed and Qureshi quantifies and compares wellness across countries using a cross-country empirical analysis. The authors develop a multi-dimensional index of wellness, which can be used to compare wellness across countries. The fourth chapter by Kun Singh, Barsabal, Alvarez, and Maria Singham analyzes the production and employment of linkages in developing Asia's wellness industries. The authors quantify the size of wellness industries and the overall wellness economy in developing Asia. Part three of the book examines diverse avenues to physical wellness. Chapter five by Young and Johnston delve into the issue of physical activity economy in Asia. They examine market size, participation, barriers, and the options to increase physical activity. Chapter six of the book, again by Young and Johnston, covers the important issue of workplace wellness in Asia. Their chapter covers a wide range of issues, including occupational safety, the risk from overworking, and the need for better work-life balance. Chapter 7 by Thao, Farrell, Helble, and Rachmi delve into the issue of eating in developing Asia. They examine the main trends and consequences and put forth policies for better eating among Asians. Part 4 looks at mental wellness and the potential contribution of Asian traditions to promoting mental wellness. Chapter 8 by Boddicker takes an in-depth look at mental wellness. Mental wellness has become an even bigger issue during the highly stressful COVID-19 pandemic. Chapter 9, again by Boddicker, introduces us to various Asian traditions of wellness. Perhaps more than any other region of the world, Asia is home to a rich tradition of wellness evident in Indian yoga, Chinese Tai Chi, and many other local traditions. Chapter 10 by Boddicker, Pandit, Krising, and Tian examine the issue of aging and wellness. Wellness is important for everybody, but it is especially important for the elderly who tend to be physically and mentally weaker. Chapter 11 by Wayne and Russell analyze the wellness tourism industry. They conclude that wellness tourism is a highly promising component of the global tourism industry. Part five of the book looks at how wellness can contribute to happiness and inclusion. Chapter 12 by Wang examines the link between wellness and happiness. 
the empirical analysis of the chapter finds that wellness does in fact contribute to happiness. Chapter 13 by Johnston, Young, and Boddicker examine the wide range of policy options available to promote wellness in Asia. In particular, they propose policies for promoting wellness among all Asians, including poor Asians. Finally, chapter 14 by Park concludes the book. Let me conclude with three key takeaways from the book. First, in light of the devastating COVID-19 pandemic, now is a most opportune time to examine physical and mental wellness in Asia. Second, Asia has a rich tradition of wellness and Asia should leverage this wellness tradition as an engine of both economic growth and individual well-being. Wellness policies span a lifetime and they should target wellness for all Asians. The four cross-cutting domains of wellness policies are creating a healthy built environment, supporting physical activity, encouraging healthy eating, and improving wellness in the workplace. You can access the book for free at the link shown on the screen. I now give the floor to Tanya Kuchenmuller of the World Health Organization. She will discuss a toolkit that can help operationalize the concepts discussed in the wellness book. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dong Yang, for this excellent overview. Um, it was very interesting to listen to the different chapters and um, the content. So let me introduce you quickly to Ms. Tanya Kuchenmüller from WHO. Tanya leads the Evidence to Policy Impact Unit in the Research for Health Department of the Science Division at WHO headquarters. The unit has the dual mandate of strengthening country capacity in generating, translating, and using the best available research evidence in policies and practice. And second, providing leadership on policies in research to ensure access and scale-up. So Tanya, over to you. Thanks very much, Matthias. And also many thanks to Dong Yung for passing the floor to me, um, as well as inviting uh, WHO to join uh, the Asian Impact Webinar today, focusing on the launch of the Wellness for Healthy Asia book. Um, now that we know about the importance of wellness in Asia, the question is, and I'm going to focus on that, how do we translate it into um, policy? Let me try to share my slides. Um, so um, WHO, in fact, has long time thought already about how to promote the use of research and evidence in policy, trying to um, bridge what we call the so-called uh, the, the so no-do gap, meaning the gap between knowing what to do, what research tells us to do, and actually the policies and actions that are being um, delivered. As you can see on this slide, though, there is no direct link, not a linear link, no automatism between research and policy. Um, on the right hand side, you see that, for example, it took more than 250 years until finally, and that's, of course, a very, um, is an older but very prominent example, that it took more than 250 years until finally lemon juice um, was used on Navy ships to prevent scurvy. But also nowadays, um, 30 to 40 percent of patients in the US and also Europe fail to receive cost effective interventions justified by available evidence, just as that um, 20 to 25 percent of patients. Um, and that's maybe even worse. Um, they do not um, get um, the um, care that is needed um, or is potentially, so the care that they get is potentially even harmful. Overall is that um, when we have a look at the research being translated into action, that only about um, approximately eight to 15% is actually um, then triggering practice change. And that is um, a situation, of course, that we would like to change so that uh, important pieces of evidence, such as the wellness book of the Asian Development Bank, is actually being used at country level. Um, on the following slide, I'm just going to mention two different methods that we are applying in order to promote the use of evidence in decision making. On the one hand, um, one of the approaches is 
what we call is going global. And so what we mean by that is um, here to combine the best available evidence globally or regionally generated in the form of systematic reviews and evidence synthesis um, to the local level to contextualize it there, the findings, combining it with what we know um, uh, about uh, judgments on evidence that is more linking with values, needs and costs. So really making sure that global and regional evidence is applicable and contextualized at local level. So that's one of the key methods that we apply. The other one is um, that we need to apply demand-driven approaches. And what we mean by that is really looking at country level, what is the key priority? Identifying the problem, the issue that the country is grappling with, and then identifying, um, for example, in the area of mental wellness, as Dong Yong was saying, during COVID-19, which was in many countries a key um, problem, but also in aging societies, of course, um, aging and wellness is, um, is a key uh, issue that many countries are dealing with. So understanding the full problem, its magnitude and causes, as well as consequences that um, are being identified and underpinned by local data evidence um, to really uh, pin it down to concrete um, issues that needs to be addressed. So the problem is being identified first at country level. But then, of course, um, it doesn't help just identifying the problem, but we also need to identify solutions. And so these solutions are also evidence-based. You see here three different options on the slide that um, we normally propose to policymakers to address a particular country problem. Benefits, harms, costs, and cost effectiveness are being identified for each of the options. And then in addition, not only problem and options are being put uh, in front of policymakers, but at the same time also um, information about how to implement each of the options. So barriers and facilitators are being identified and then also strategies, how to um, overcome barriers and how to further um, build on facilitators in order for options to be implemented in the best manner at country level. So these two different methods, um, the going local and also the demand driven approach are being summarized in one of our key tools um, that we use at WHO, which is the evidence informed policy. Sorry, there's the, ev um, the evidence, um, evidence brief for policy that EVIPNET, the evidence informed policy network is applying. And you can clearly see on this slide, the link between the two methods that I've just highlighted. So bringing together local and local evidence, but also ensuring that the evidence brief for policy is outlining the three sections that I mentioned, the problem, the options, the implementation considerations, and all this evidence is being presented to policymakers and decision makers in a user-friendly way. We call it a 1325 format, which is all about um, summarizing everything into um, one page of key messages for the busy um, people who don't have time to read um, through um, more than one page. Then three pages of uh, executive summary and then 25 pages really providing the full evidence also um, the references, um, upraised evidence to give sufficient credibility to the um, evidence brief for policy then ultimately also being used. So the evidence brief for policy is providing a roadmap, so to say, for policymakers to address a high priority um, policy issue at country level. As an example here, um, the evidence brief for policy that was developed in Moldova by, the, by a local team, um, looking at um, alcohol um, legislation, and um, to provide a bit of the context here, so how we move forward um, in Moldova, but also in other countries throughout the world, is that um, it's not WHO putting the evidence together, but we are working with a local team, a local multidisciplinary and multi-sectoral team, where we provide um, training, capacity building, technical assistance and mentoring, so that it is this local multi-sectoral, multidisciplinary team that um, develops the evidence brief for policy. Um, in this particular case, you can see um, that um, the evidence brief for policy, so a piece of research that was developed, um, did lead to, to impact, um, uh, as you can see on the uh, right-hand side. So on the one hand, the alcohol control legislation, which previously was not applicable to beer because beer was not officially recognized as alcohol, changed because of the evidence brief for policy. And beer is now officially recognized in, alcohol and in Moldova which is, by the way, um, the country with the highest alcohol consumption per capita annually worldwide. Either it's on number one or number two. Um, so changing the alcohol legislation um, is going to make a major impact on um, the population's health. But not only that, not only that the alcohol control, control legislation was changed, in addition, also um, stricter regulation for advertisement um, was um, put uh, forward and approved in its first reading. 
and secondly, excise taxation on alcoholic beverages introduced. Um, so in that sense, um, here, um, a piece of work where you can demonstrate that through the work that we undertook um, with the Evidence-Informed Policy Network, FFNet, in collaboration with partners um, and the country level, is uh, reducing the gap between uh, research and policy, the no-do gap that I mentioned earlier. I'm uh, concluding with a slide um, to highlight uh, the, the toolkit that um, Dong Yung mentioned earlier. So the toolkit that you see on this page, which is accessible freely on the WHO website, is used um, to guide countries uh, to develop evidence brief for policies. So if you're interested in it, um, please do check out um, this kind of manual. And to give a bit of background also on the EVAPNET, the Evidence Informed Policy Network that, as I mentioned, is supporting countries in um, developing these kind of evidence brief for policies, but not only there is a wide portfolio of other knowledge translation tools available that we um, also promote. But the EVAPNET is uh, a network that is increasing country knowledge translation and evidence informed decision making, but not only increasing individual um, capacities of researchers or policymakers and enhancing their skills and knowledge in this field. But what we're aiming to is um, strengthening institutional capacity and institutionalizing mechanisms of research to policy to really ensure that the investments that WHO, but also the countries in particular undertaking are available um, longer term and in a sustainable manner. Um, EVAPNET is a network of networks of uh, global, regional and country level networks and we are live in three regions, um, in particular in EMRO, PAHO, and also uh, EURO, with other regions stepping up and um, live in more than 50 member states worldwide. So thank you very much, um, and that would be it from my side. Matthias, over to you again. Thank you so much, Tanya, for this uh, wonderful overview and uh, for sharing with us how to best uh, translate evidence into uh, actual policies. So let us now turn to the a panel discussion. I have the great honor to have a very distinguished panel with me today. Let me briefly introduce the four panelists. We have first uh, Mr. Gary Bodecker. Gary is chairperson of the Oxford-based Global In Initiative for Traditional Systems of Health, and he also chairs the Mental Wellness Initiative of the Global Wellness Institute. He has researched and taught in the Medical Sciences Division at Oxford University for two decades, and is adjunct professor of epidemiology at Columbia University. Second, we have Ms. Tara Kesaram. Tara is working as team lead for non-communicable diseases and healthier populations in the WHO country office in Jakarta, Indonesia. Previously, Tara worked for WHO in the Solomon Islands, the Philippines, as well as in Bangladesh. Her work is dedicated to contributing to global health equity, especially through tackling the burden of NCDs and their risk factors. Third, we have Shud Novianti Rajmi. She's a medical doctor by training and currently works as a consultant with Reconstra Utama Integra, a research training and consulting company based in Jakarta, Indonesia. Her interest includes the triple burden of malnutrition and adolescent health, and she has been involved in projects with the Indonesia's Ministry of Health and various international organizations. And last but certainly not least, Mr. Scott Wayne, Scott is based in Washington, D.C., where he's heading an international development consultancy. And thank you so much, Scott, for getting up uh, that early for us to be here with us today. Scott has more than 25 years of experience in sustainable destination development and has provided advice to various international organizations, private sector government and NGOs in more than 50 countries in every region of the world. So a warm welcome to all of you. So I will first ask a couple of questions to each panelist and then uh, open the floor for uh, questions. I already see that some very good questions are coming in. Um, so let the, let's let the discussion begin. Let me start with Gary. Um, as we all know, Asia is home of a growing and already very large elderly population. Uh, what are some specific ways in which wellness can promote better health and productivity among elderly Asians. Gary, over to you. Yes, Matthias. Um, actually, at the moment, colleagues and I are just finalizing a book which will be out in the new year called Healthy Aging in Asia. So we're very much immersed in this. And uh, I think um, a lead really is given to us by Japan, which has adopted a policy that they call living the 100-year life. 
Um, and living the 100 year life means take a stepping back. And I think when we talk about policy change in light of COVID and the mental health crisis and the mental health pandemic, as WHO has identified it, we need to start in a different way. Um, and that is really to say, what does a well life look like and where can it go? And I think we're getting some guidance from Japan on this. Japan is saying we have over 80,000 people who are over 100 years old. How did they get there? And what is their quality of life? And we know that this gets down to nutrition, uh, healthy nutrition, which is largely plant-based. We know that um, Western fast foods and sugary drinks um, have a detrimental effect on health and aging. Uh, if we're going to take a lifespan approach, we have to get this message out through the education system. So you can't talk to people in their 60s and 70s about how to live to 100. You have to talk to preschool children and primary school children and onward throughout the education system and the workforce about living the 100 year life, what that means. So it's healthy nutrition, as Dr. Park mentioned. Exercise is absolutely fundamental, regular exercise. This is not just getting to 100. This is actively living a life that will generate a healthy 100 years. And so it takes commitment, engagement throughout the lifespan. Evidence is needed. Uh, Asia has a wealth of traditions to draw on. Asia also has a wealth of traditional foods which need to come onto the front burner for this. Asia has meditative practices for reducing stress. And um, Asia also has uh, very, very well-respected ancient knowledge systems like Ayurveda, Chinese medicine, Kampo, uh, Korean medicine, Southeast Asian traditions, which have a full lifestyle guidance about living a healthy and well life. And this is there to be drawn on and science is there to support it. So I think for healthy aging, we have to take a lifespan approach. We have to have an end point, which is given to us, I think, by Japan, living the 100 year life healthily and well, getting there in good shape so that 100 isn't a big deal in Japan now, 110 is. I think that's that's our perspective. Thank you very much, Gary. That sounds very promising. And uh, I think we're all looking forward to living 100 years in a healthy and uh, good uh, state and uh, condition. So uh, you mentioned also the topic of uh, physical activity and um, let me bring in uh, Tara on this topic of um, exercise. Um, Tara, as we all know, um, the, the, the living environment in many Asian cities is not very conducive to physical activity. And uh, prior to, to the pandemic, we were often uh, stuck in, in traffic and, and now we're often stuck at home. Um, so maybe you, you could share with us why actually physical activity is so important um, for our body, but also for our mind. Over Thank to you. you. Thank you, thanks. Um, indeed, there was a lot of time spent sitting in traffic and the location of our sedentariness has shifted during this pandemic. And for many people, the amount of time spent sitting has increased from being in the house. So physical activity can be seen as an antidote to the situation. Prolonged sitting in itself is associated with poor health outcomes. But when you look at the long list of benefits that physical activity in itself has for our physical, our mental, our emotional, our cognitive health across the lifespan, it's outstanding. There are a few, um, few interventions which we actively advise people to engage in, which have such multitude of positive impacts. And these include direct benefits to the individual, such as a reduction in risk of heart disease, strokes, certain cancers, diabetes, and symptoms of anxiety and depression, as well as maintenance of a healthy body weight and cardiorespiratory fitness. 
In children, physical activity has benefits for heart and lung health, but also for cognitive performance. And in older persons, it can reduce the risk of falls. But the benefits actually extend even further beyond the individual. At the societal level, engagement in physical activity can build connections between people. It can foster the sense of community, especially through sports and group activities, for example. And at a population level, the more active a society is, the less reliant it is on transportation options which generate emissions. So that means you can get cleaner air and you can get less congested roads. So physical activity is important for bodies, for minds, for communities, for sustainable development and our planet. Excellent. So um, if you go back to Gary's point about uh, nutrition, um, I would like to bring in now a shoot, and I think she cannot connect via video because uh, her internet not, or can you? Okay, it's working very good. So as we all know, and as, as we all have enjoyed already, Asia has a very rich uh, culinary tradition and um, economic growth has made now food available, um, better food, more food to almost all income groups. So uh, the level of, of hunger has gone down tremendously in Asia. Um, but still, there are, uh, there are a lot of challenges when it comes to nutrition today in Asia. So could you share with us some of these challenges? And for me, also an interesting question is whether more healthy also means, uh, more, more wealthy also means more healthy in, in terms of, does more food mean also to be in a better uh, state, physical state? Over to you, Shoot. Thanks, Matthias. Okay, so first, of course, um, there are benefits to dietary diversity. Um, I think we can see it now that people are exploring their traditional food more and more, and many people are actually starting a healthier diet, right? And many dietary guidelines stated that you should look for the food that's available in your environment, that people have other sources of carbohydrates, for example, instead of only rice. Now, today's challenge of nutrition is actually called the double burden of malnutrition. I'm sure most of you know this, where a condition of undernutrition exists with um, overnutrition at the same time. Now, some people, Matthias, they still focus on undernutrition since it has a direct impact that can be directly seen in your health, such as when you're underweight, you can actually see that you're more prone to diseases, you look skinny or your skin looks dry, but when you're overweight, you do not directly see the bad impact like right away. Um, however, the actual impact will happen to you years from now you will have higher risk of um, NCDs and higher chance of having a heart attack or other cardiovascular diseases. Now, when, when people already have um, non-communicable diseases, um, they actually stick with them throughout their life. So people need to realize that we can actually prevent all of these NCDs. Now, if we think about the cost that one country has to bear in tackling NCDs, it is enormous. The estimated annual cost of treatment of malnutrition itself is up to $2 trillion, if I'm not mistaken, per year. So it is essential for us to have multi-sector policy approaches that address both the consumer side and then the supply side in ways that create food environments that supports you know, availability and then attractiveness, convenience, uh, affordability of healthy food. For the second question, um, does wealthy means more healthy? Um, of course not. Uh, for one thing, income does affect how and where your food is sourced, right? But with more money, people will have higher purchasing power. I think we all recognize that. But when you do not have enough knowledge or willingness to have healthier food choices, Purchasing power can be dangerous, Matthias. So I think there is a lot of research that has already shown that both undernutrition and overnutrition actually happened in all socioeconomic status categories. And one research, and we quote this in one of the chapters in the book, that's why people should read the book, uh, that those with higher incomes, um, they purchase a significant amount of pre-prepared -pre foods, such as those from convenience stores, from restaurants, and also from street vendors. Thank you, Matthias, over to you. Thank you very much for sharing your insights and um, the latest evidence on that topic. So Scott, uh, let's turn to you and I hope uh, you're still uh, well, well awake. Uh, I would like to <laughs> ask 
you some questions about wellness uh, tourism. Um, so, I mean, one question that we often uh, received was uh, on, on, on wellness tourism is that uh, what is actually wellness tourism? Because everybody who takes holidays does so to rest uh, the mind and the body. Um, so what is specific about uh, wellness tourism? Could you please explain? Thank you. Sure. Thank, thanks, Matthias. Thanks for the thanks for the question. Thought provoking, uh, especially at three thirty in the morning here in Washington. Um, you know, it, the, there's no uh, universal definition of, of wellness tourism, but I, you know, I think that the Global Wellness Institute has perhaps defined it best, and they and yeah, you know, and they define it as travel associated with uh, the goal of maintaining or enhancing one's personal well-being. And that also includes the pursuit of physical, mental, spiritual, or environmental wellness while traveling for, for either leisure or business. Now, in a sense, COVID has thrown a bit of a wrench into this definition and I think has, um, has shown a need to, to broaden the definition and, and, and conceive of this, conceive of wellness tourism, not only in terms of individual travelers, but uh, in terms of the destination. And I think one of, the, one of the trends we're going to see coming out of COVID, and we're seeing it already, is increased demand for healthy destinations. Uh, the, the World Travel and Tourism Council has created this safe travels destination stamp. And a lot of countries, including many in, many in Asia, have adopted this, this stamp, which I think reassures travelers that the destination is taking the necessary measures to safeguard, to ensure the highest possible health standards, hygiene, cleanliness. And, and that I think is, is going forward gonna be even more in demand. And it also, it also reinforces an increased demand for sustainability, an increased understanding of sustainability. When tourism suddenly stopped, I think destinations, travelers suddenly realized that uh, the impact, some of the negative impacts that tourism had been having on destinations, um, suddenly the air was cleaner, the water was cleaner, and, and people are, have sort of taken a step back and they want to see that continue. They, they want to see sustainability in a more important part. And I think going forward, we're going to see uh, an even a greater emphasis on uh, the sustainable development goals as becoming very much a part of tourism strategies and wellness tourism. So I am seeing this, uh, especially in terms of, of healthy destinations. I think we're going to see increased demand for that. Thank you very much, uh, Scott. Um, that uh, was very useful. And this also leads us to some of the questions that have been asked. And thank you so much, everybody, for the very active uh, participation. We received a couple of questions, and a lot of them are about implementation. So I think we all agree that wellness is very important. And now the question is how to achieve uh, higher levels of wellness. And uh, uh, one person asks, in the post-COVID world, what should governments prioritize, wellness policy or economic development? Um, or I would say, is it actually, can it go together? Can we achieve economic development uh, and uh, better wellness uh, uh, for, for all? So who would like to answer that question? Um, maybe Gary? Um, yes, Matthias, I'm happy to um, uh, take a shot at that. Um, one of the things we know is that um, in terms of promoting economic development, that requires a healthy and motivated workforce. Um, and the latest research is showing that there is a huge tendency among employees to want to resign and leave their job and find something better. Um, that's what this pandemic has done. People have been sitting at home and reflecting. Um, and in a sense, economic development is going to depend on creating an environment that offers well-being to employees in order to attract and retain them. So there are two sides of the same coin. You can't power ahead with economic development and assume that the workforce are just willing cogs 
who are going to turn as commanded. They're not. They're ready to walk, and they are walking in huge numbers, and they will go to where their personal well-being, their personal uh, mental health is taken care of, not just in token terms with verbal policies, but is actualized, um, is modeled by managers, um, and is a, a place where work can be done in a way that is supportive, nourishing, and growth promoting. And that, of course, gets the best productivity out of people and enhances economic development. So they are very uh, intimately intertwined. Thank you very much, Gary. This uh, brings me to a really question. Um, and I would like to um, ask this question to Tara. So uh, one person raised the point of what do you think is the greatest hindrance to effective wellness policy? And maybe we could a little bit focus on physical activity. And, and Tara, you have worked on um, various risk factors of NCDs. And I think physical activity is a very interesting one. So in your experience, what are some of the, uh, you know, obstacles when we want to implement uh, policies that would be conducive, conducive to more physical activity? Thanks, Matthias. I think for physical activity, we really, uh, to, to promote population levels of it, we really need to live and realize this mantra of multi-sectoral collaboration, which my, my colleagues uh, have highlighted here today. It's going to take engagement across sectors. So with health, with transport, with education, communication, sports, local government, just to name a few. And that's That's perhaps not something that's always come easy. It does require a conscious effort to engage with counterparts from, from different sectors as well. Um, I think what also needs to happen is that there needs to be coherent policy that lines up towards goals for uh, reducing physical inactivity or promoting physical activity. Um, that can also be a challenge to make sure policies don't contradict each other. Um, one of the other things to note So I think is that governments don't need to do this alone. Um, there's so many actors out there that can help. And so it's also about mobilizing academia, professional organizations, media, NGOs, and communities especially. Um, and I emphasize communities because one of the things we really need to be conscious of is health inequities. And I think uh, governments uh, and all our partners can really take an active focus on this by engaging with Uh, communities that have higher levels of physical inactivity because there are stark inequities by gender, by socioeconomic status, by urban rural location or ability or disability. And so engaging with those population groups can help us design better programs which make um, wellness or physical activity inclusive for all. Thank you very much, Tara. There's a question about um, digital tools that we now have um, available and uh, maybe that's a, a question that relates to also eating because uh, we can now know much more about um, the food we're consuming and and should maybe you can tell us a bit more on whether digitalization can can help us make better food choices are there any interesting initiatives in Indonesia should Yes, I think uh, one of the initiatives that we have in Indonesia is actually to um, engage um, the adolescents uh, in Indonesia to start on um, sharing about their food or their meal of the day. Uh, in Indonesia, we have this one initiative started by the government, and Tara, you may support me in this, called uh, Isi Piringku, or What's on My Plate. So we actually have a portion of what should be on your plate, right? And then the adolescents in Indonesia right now, they're actually sharing what's on their plate right now. And then, um, you know, they use um, the social media, their social media, and then aside to that, because when it comes to food and nutrition, Matthias, I think it, it went beyond just a, a healthy diet. A healthy diet consists not only of eating better food or having better nutrition, but also having um, an active life. That's why physical activity and diet um, or good nutrition is inseparable. Um, so the adolescent in Indonesia, and this has become quite a strong uh, approach in um, asking all of other uh, age groups in Indonesia 
Indonesia as well to share about what they're having or what are they eating for the day, especially for their meals. And then aside to that, um, if you are familiar with Indonesian, um, Indonesian is very hardcore in TikTok players, Matthias. So they're actually using the physical activity or they're starting an initiative or a new movement in TikTok, and then everyone will go uh, along with that. So I think the role of digitalization, especially the use of social media is very crucial. And then you can actually make the use of the power of young people. So adolescence is right now, I think they come up with um, more and more initiative, um, the things that we wouldn't think about in the first place, Matthias. So let's make use of our adolescents. Thank you very much. Um, what I also see from the questions is this interest in kind of making wellness um, accessible to everybody and um, to make it inclusive. And um, I would like to uh, maybe go back to Scott about um, also domestic uh, wellness tourism because um, I think it's an important uh, aspect to it, especially now amid the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, tourism is also, you know, often an in industry where there might not, not be always, you know, a, a good um, outcome in terms of, of equity. Um, Scott, can you maybe, maybe tell us a bit more how to, to make wellness tourism accessible to, to many people? Um. The um, great thing about, about wellness tourism is, is that it, uh, you know, it depends on healthy living and well-being, preservation of nature and, and culture. And, and, it, and I see it becoming a pathway, a solution for, for recovery and sustainability. Uh, and so, and one of the trends that happened during COVID is it was much more of a turning inward in destinations um, out of necessity, uh, international tourism, international travel uh, completely collapsed. And you know, over the past year and a half, it, it's, it, it's essentially sort of crawling out of, out of, a, out of a hole. And, and in the process, I think a lot of countries, India, especially China have, rediscovered the importance of their domestic tourism sectors. And there have been a number of initi uh, initiatives to really emphasize domestic tourism. In India, for instance, uh, they had already set up a national medical wellness tourism promotion board. And even by 2017, there were over 50 million domestic wellness trips just in, in India. And I think, you know, there isn't precise data yet available, but, but I think that has increased in India through uh, various national initiatives. Uh, China had already launched a, what they call the Healthy China 2030 initiative. And starting back in 2016, they, they really started to push for, uh, for wellness nationally, domestic tourism. Hot springs are an important, important part of that. They have an annual international wellness industry expo. Uh, in 2017, the Global Wellness Institute estimated more than 62 million domestic wellness trips just in, in China. And there are a number of, of other markets, the same, the same sort of trend. So I think this bodes well in an equity sense in terms of looking more at what's on your doorstep, what's in your backyard, what's available, what sort of assets. I think a lot of countries around the world, throughout Asia and beyond, really discovered uh, what's around them and, and have put more importance on that. So I think that uh, helps reinforce uh, more equity in, in tourism development. And, and going forward, I hope that that continues. Um, I, if I could just for a moment, go back to your economic development question, because I think you know, it reminds me of Matthias, you know, we were working earlier this year on the, on the future of tourism. And there is a bit of a concern between, there, there's increased personal demand for sustainability, which, which I think feeds well into wellness tourism. But there is some tension with governments rushing to recover uh, their economies, rushing to recover their, their jobs. And one of the things we heard in our research for that report earlier this year, especially from the travel industry, is that it appears that government, governments are, are trying to find the quickest solutions to, to that recovery. And sustainability may be taking a bit of a backseat. 
and, and I wonder the effect that will have in terms of in, you know, on the wellness segment. <clears throat> At the same time, <clears throat> excuse me, losing my voice at 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it, uh, I, I do think it, it may have some impact, but it, it is kind of a um, tension between wellness as a solution, as a path to recovery, and, and governments rushing to recover their employment. So kind of a roundabout yeah. way of answering your question, but yeah. <laughs> no, that was uh, excellent. And that uh, brings me also to a question that um, another person is asking about um, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic and what wellness policy should be implemented or strengthened by countries. And I would like to rephrase that question a bit uh, in terms of, uh, as we all know, the fight against the pandemic was expensive and uh, uh, the fiscal space is limited. So what do you think, what should be the priorities when it comes to, to wellness policy in the coming uh, years? Anybody would like to, to answer that question? I'm happy to, uh, to give a perspective here. Um, I think especially in this region, uh, tobacco control would be what I would think would be number one for prioritization. We've really seen how those who have uh, been, been smoking tobacco have been at higher risk of severe outcomes from COVID-19 infection. But of course, we also know that uh, tobacco use is a leading cause of cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, cancers as well. So I think going forward, both from a health and an economic and sustainable financial development uh, perspective, tobacco control really needs to be prioritized. Anybody has a different opinion or <laughs> would like to add something? Matthias, I'd like to add to that. There's, Tara is absolutely right. Um, you know, there are lifestyle, uh, there are problematic lifestyle um, behaviors. Alcohol consumption is another one. Alcohol is extremely pro-inflammatory um, and inflammation is one of the causes of death, uh, out of control inflammation causes of death with COVID-19. Um, I'd also like to sort of flip it over um, and come back to Asia's traditions. Um, you know, a lot of the medicinal plants that are included in Indonesia, in Malaysia, in Thailand, in the Philippines, in foods and salads, are anti-inflammatory, are anti-viral, antiviral, are immunomodulatory. Um, and I think that people can enhance their resistance and their resilience. It's not to say that they won't be infected. Obviously, immunization is the number one priority. But we're seeing that even with immunization, it's still possible to be infected. So how do you get less sick? And obviously that is by strengthening your body. Clearly, as Tara's pointed out, you get rid of damaging lifestyle practices, but then you can have health promoting lifestyle practices too. And Asian traditions are very rich in these. Um, you know, bitter good, for instance, uh, which is widespread in Asian medicine and Asian culinary traditions is very effective against type 2 managing type 2 diabetes. There's research showing a significant reduction in type 2 diabetes with bitter good consumption. Diabetes is one of the big risk factors for death from COVID. Um, turmeric, widespread throughout Asia as a food and medicine, uh, is a very powerful anti-inflammatory agent. Uh, and an immunomodulatory agent. Knowledge about this, uh, knowledge about the risks of fast foods and sugary drinks that are so widely promoted, um, that are extremely damaging to health, and the health enhancing benefits of Asia's traditional foods uh, and, and lifestyle practices can be made front burner at this time going forward. So. It's both, it's stopping damaging practices, promoting health and life enhancing practices, drawing on Asia's huge wealth of traditional knowledge in this field. Thank you very much, Gary. Um, we will all um, try to um, translate this lesson in, into our daily lifestyle. Um, 
one last question. We have about five minutes left. Is a um, um, person asked, we know that there has been an increase in awareness of the importance of wellness that came with COVID-19. Do you foresee a future where this awareness bounces back to how it was before? So uh, do you think we have, we, we're now witnessing a permanent shift or will we go back to, to the old normal? Um, who would like to answer that question? I'll have a crack at it, Matthias. I feel like maybe I'm speaking too much or does, Scott, you want to say something? You want to go first? Oh, just to reinforce the, the point I made earlier about um, about the government's rush to try to recover their economies. I, I, I hope and truly want to believe that um, things will not, are not going back to what they were. But, but I, do, I do see this sort of tension between um, a, a, a need to recover economies and recover economic development as quickly as possible. And, and yeah, to, in, in travel and tourism, which, which really, it, and especially in wellness, encompasses such a broad um, number of sectors and subsectors. Uh, so, it, you know, you, you could say it's everybody's business and, and it overlaps everything. Um, that, you know, it will have, it, it, it could have an effect in both ways. It could be sort of a negative side that we're going to go back to what, what was because that's the easiest, fastest way to do things. Or more sustainable, which is a little more challenging, takes more effort. Uh, but I, you know, I, I, I think public sentiment, public demand is going in that direction towards, you know, people are, are more aware of the need to be healthier, to have healthier lives. And, 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 I, and I do think that could, that will translate, but it will require an effort, coordination among governments. Um, I think ADB's push in that direction will be, will be a, 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 a huge help to steer countries, to steer, to help guide uh, demand and, and response to that demand. So um, Thank can you. I just only, add? Yeah, Sorry. Gary, we're running out of time, but please, yeah, sure. quickly, yeah. Yeah, um, I just want to um, challenge this concept of when we go back to normal. Um, I think that the, one of the biggest myths out there at the moment is this term post-pandemic. I don't think there is a post-pandemic in sight. I think with COVID is what we're looking at. And I think that's going to be the biggest um, incentive for people to get as healthy as possible um, to prevent illness because it's not going away. WHO has said that in the past 24 hours. Thank you so much, Gary. I think uh, that could well be the case. Um, and with this, I think I will close this uh, very interesting and stimulating uh, panel discussion. Uh, thank you so much, all the panelists, for sharing your interesting insights and thoughts. And uh, for um, also, I would like to thank all the, um, the participants um, today for their very interesting questions and, and, and for listening to this Asian Impact uh, webinar. Um, so please download uh, our new book. Uh, I hope we can uh, guide uh, the wellness policy um, now and in the, in the years to come. Um, I would like also to take the opportunity now to announce our next um, Asian Impact webinar. It will be held on uh, November 9th from 2 to 3. The topic will be on transforming agriculture in Asia. Our colleagues Sakashi and Manisha will present the latest findings on this very exciting topic. So don't miss it. So thank you very much again, everybody. Stay well and goodbye.